Welcome back, everyone. Today on The Joseph Carlson Show, Elon's still trying to buy Twitter, but they implemented the poison pill. We're going to be talking about whether or not Twitter should sell to Elon. Disney has stepped into a political mess with their opposition of the Don't Say Gay bill, and politicians are fiercely fighting back against Disney. Some of the potential ramifications that they're proposing are very severe against Disney. And it seems like the NFT bubble has started to pop. The original Jack Dorsey tweet that sold for $2.9 million is having a difficult time finding a bidder now. And lastly, we have new news of more unions. We've talked about the Starbucks union. We've talked about the Amazon union. Now we have Apple workers starting to unionize as well. So we'll be talking about this news as well. Now let's go ahead and start off with a portfolio update. The first thing that I want to say is that this is a very difficult market. This has been the most difficult time that I've ever invested in, in terms of trying to make gains in individual companies or in ETFs. It's been a very, very difficult market. The indexes are down 7 to 12% from their all-time highs, and individual companies, especially the ones that were more reckless, have been punished like crazy. There's lots of companies like PayPal and Facebook that have sold down over 50%. When you're investing in individual companies, you have to be willing to go through periods of underperformance. And if you can't do that, you should move to an ETF. If you don't have that mentality, I've owned companies that have both gone up a lot in this market, like Costco, and ones that have struggled, like Disney. And I feel completely fine owning both of them because I have a long-term perspective. In fact, on this note, I developed a tool to be able to look at your companies and see how they're doing overall, which direction they're trading. It's called the Dip Finder, and it's a technical way of looking at how your companies are trading. You look at the current price versus the 200-day simple moving average. In my portfolio, almost every company is moving down. Literally every one of them except for Apple and Costco. Costco is the only company that's doing well. It's 19% above its 200-day moving average, which means it has a lot of upwards momentum. And you can see that upwards momentum reflected in the stock price. This is what the dip finder tracks. Costco's not in a dip. In fact, it's in the opposite of a dip. It's in a price surge. And while it's great that Costco is doing well, the majority of my portfolio is doing poorly almost every single company. T. Rowe Price and Starbucks are down 26% below their 200-day moving average. That means that they're down a lot over their recent history. Domino's Pizza is down 19%. JP Morgan, the same. These companies are selling down like crazy. Now, when I look at this, rather than becoming discouraged and feeling like a bad investor, I realize that all of these companies are not bad companies. They're not all trading down because they're doing poorly. This is just market trading. This is the market giving you opportunities to buy into high quality companies at discounted prices. And even though it feels bad, looking at all these companies go down in price, we should have the opposite approach. If you're a long-term investor, you should look at this as windows of opportunity. When I look at this chart here, I see the companies that have traded up a lot like Apple and Costco. And I think, you know what? I'm going to hold off on buying those companies. Those aren't the best ones to buy at this time. Instead, I'll be focusing my buys on this left half here. These companies that are trading down for what I consider to be temporary reasons. I don't think there's any reason why T. Rowe Price or Starbucks or Domino's or JP Morgan should be selling off to the extent they are. I think these companies are traded down way past their fair value. So when I look at my portfolio, those are exactly the type of companies I've been buying. I've been buying more Starbucks. I've been buying more Domino's. I recently increased my stake in T. Rowe Price by $1,000. And if JP Morgan continues to trade down on fears of recession, I'll be buying more of this company. And on the other side of things, I'm not buying Costco. I think this company's traded up with a lot of momentum it's considered a defensive, recession-resistant, inflation-resistant business. So everyone wants in on this company right now, and I don't consider it the optimal time to be buying this company. If anything, I should be looking at trimming my position, but I haven't done that yet. So, so far, I haven't been doing any selling. I've been buying more and more of these companies that have been trading down on a dip, and I've been buying them with a combination of deposits and dividends. For example, I just recently received a $406 dividend from Vici Properties. That's a pretty hefty dividend. That dividend was not reinvested back into Vici because Vici is not really selling down. Instead, I used that $400 to buy another share of Domino's, which is in a dip. So I'm using the dividends of companies that are pretty flat, like Vici, trading in line with its momentum, to buy companies in a dip like Domino's or Starbucks. And I think that's what I should be doing. Now, I realize that these companies might take a long time to recover. So I'm not looking for Starbucks or Domino's or JP Morgan to recover next weekend. 
That's not the timeline that I'm investing in. I think over the course of two or three years, these buys will be very profitable. But if you're looking for a quick trade, if you're looking for these companies to swing back upwards in a week or two, I think you're making a mistake. I think you need to have a lot longer of a timeline. So that's what I've been doing with my portfolio overall. I've been continually dollar cost averaging in and using dividends to buy the companies on this left hand that are in a dip. And by the way, if you wanna use this tool, it's included as part of the Patreon. Now moving on, we have a continuation of the story of Elon Musk wanting to buy Twitter. Twitter has implemented the poison pill, which is a way of structurally avoiding a hostile takeover from an individual like Elon Musk. So Twitter's in defensive mode. They're saying that it may not be in the best interest of the shareholders to have Elon Musk step in and buy the company. And they might have some valid arguments, but Elon Musk is saying that Twitter's board is not aligned with the shareholders' interest. Twitter's board simply wants to keep their jobs. They don't really care about the stock price. They don't really care about Twitter shareholders. And I have to say, I agree with Elon Musk here. If you look at the combined ownership of everyone but Jack Dorsey, who by the way is leaving Twitter's board, you see that they own a very meaningless amount of the company. They own something like 0.1% of the company. So they're not in this for their huge ownership of Twitter and wanting to grow the share price. They're on the Twitter board, like Carl Icahn describes in many cases, as being a country club. They're part of this prestigious group of people that are on a board, they get paid a huge salary, and they get to be involved in running one of the most important assets in the US. That is something that's prestigious and gives them a lot of clout. And I don't think that they wanna give this up, even if it's in the benefit of the shareholder. So I agree with Elon Musk. He's saying that Twitter's board is not aligned with the company. And even Jack Dorsey has come out and criticized the Twitter board saying the same thing. Quote, it's consistently been the dysfunction of the company. Now, I appreciate Jack's honesty now that he's stepping out of Twitter and leaving the company to come out and criticize Twitter's board, but I have to ask the question, why didn't he bring this up when he was running Twitter? He had a lot of clout at the company. He was the CEO. He was the founder of the company. He owned more shares of the company than the entire board combined. And now that he's stepping away, he's highlighting the problems. So I see this as somewhat as a spineless take from Jack. I think that it's easy to highlight the problems when you're no longer in control of the company, but he ran the company for years. He was the founder. He could have tried more aggressively to change the board of Twitter, to stop the dysfunction of the company. But now that all of this drama is unfolding and the limelight is on the Twitter board and how dysfunctional they are, Jack is stepping away acting like he had nothing to do with it, like he was never in control of the company. I think Jack is a great entrepreneur, but in my opinion, this is an awfully convenient take by him to all of a sudden start highlighting the problems once he's leaving the company. Now, the question of whether or not Twitter should take the deal from Elon Musk, I think has an obvious answer. Here's the analyst Michael Nathanson's take. Our view is that this stock is overvalued by about 20 bucks, right? And if I, we wrote a note on Thursday saying, look, Twitter board, Twitter investors, take the money and run, right? Because to your point, David, if you look at the, the options they have on valuation, you'd say the stock is overvalued. And if he's willing to actually pay 5420 and finance it, there's and to me, it's, it's the best outcome for these shareholders who've been you know, buried in the stock for a long time. But the reality is the stock's overvalued. And we've argued for a long time, it's always traded on kind of the option of being a better company but not the reality of their business model, which has always been kind of disappointing. So Michael Nathanson here thinks that Twitter should take this deal and run. And he thinks the company's overvalued by about $20. So he thinks this is a significant premium to its fair value. The first thing that I'd highlight is I think it's obvious that if Elon Musk bought Twitter and he owned the company outright, he would create far more value and grow the company to become more profitable and more valuable than the current board and executive team at Twitter. These guys at Twitter have nowhere near the experience of Elon Musk in growing a company and creating value. He is literally one of the best entrepreneurs and businessmen of our generation. So I think it's obvious that he would do more with Twitter than the current executive team. But the second point that I'd bring up is that after Elon Musk buys the company, no one else has ownership in it. No one else participates in the growing of the company. He's not bringing along other shareholders like you and me like he can with Tesla. So once he pays that $54 price, all the investors are out. And it doesn't really matter for us how good he is with the company because we don't participate in any of the gains for that. 
And this brings up an interesting predicament. I asked the question on Twitter, would you be willing to sell your top conviction at a 20% gain today, knowing you could no longer own it past that point? Only 19% of you said yes, and then 81% said no. So a lot of you with your top conviction are not willing to sell out of it completely at a 20% gain, knowing that you could no longer own the company. And that could be the situation that some investors in Twitter are in. There are some investors that are long Twitter, they want the company to have a bright future, they think it can monetize and earn subscriptions and do lots of things to change the business plan that will eventually lead it to be worth a lot more than 20%. So I think there's for sure some people invested in Twitter that don't wanna take a 20% gain today because they know if they do, they can no longer participate in the gains of the company beyond that point. Twitter's probably not your highest conviction bet. It's probably not your biggest position, but there are some people that are heavily bullish on this company that really wanna own it for the long term. And I think for those people, they see 20% gains today to be completely ruled out of the future of the company as not a big enough premium. Another thing that I think needs to be pointed out is that poison pills aren't always a bad thing. Look at the example of Netflix. This was back in 2012 when Netflix was a struggling company trying to find its way. Netflix takes a poison pill to ward off Carl Icahn. And almost in the exact same way that you see Elon Musk criticizing the board of Twitter as not being aligned with the shareholders, you saw the exact same criticism from Carl Icahn. Mr. Icahn called management's move, which was not put to a shareholder vote, as quote, an example of poor corporate governance and criticized the fact that only a third of the company's board is up for re-election by shareholders each year. Icon during this time was what you would call a vulture capitalist. He would buy large stakes in companies, he would try to do anything to bump up the price in the short term, and then he would try to sell them off to larger companies. And that's exactly what he wanted to do with Netflix. He wanted to buy a big stake of the company and then to pawn it off to Microsoft or a different larger organization. And what management of Netflix did was adopt a poison pill to protect them from Carl Icahn because they knew that his bid to quickly buy the company, bump up the price a little bit, and to pawn it off wasn't in the best long-term interest of the shareholder. And Netflix was correct in this. From 2012, the time that Carl Icahn wanted to sell Netflix for parts, the stock is up 2,700%. And this is a result of them protecting themselves from Carl Icahn by adopting the poison pill. If he was able to take over a meaningful amount of the company, Netflix would have been sold for parts. Now, I'm not saying that these situations are identical. Obviously, Carl Icahn is different than Elon Musk. And the board of Netflix at the time in 2012 owned a meaningful amount of the company. Reed Hastings, for instance, owned millions of shares and he was a huge shareholder of the company. So he had a much bigger stake in Netflix's future than the current board does with Twitter. So my opinion, I think that Elon Musk is going to continue to toy with Twitter, trying to make it more difficult for the board and the executives to justify not selling the company. But I firmly believe that the board and the executives will do everything they can to not sell the company to Elon Musk. Because if they do that, they're out of a job. So they're looking out for protecting number one, which is their job and not the shareholder. Now, moving on, we have trouble for Disney. They have stepped into political turmoil with their criticism of the so-called Don't Say Gay bill, and this has started to spin out of control. Let me just say, first of all, that I have been a little bit unimpressed with Bob Chapek's leadership. I think that he's known as a good operator. He gets results for the company numerically, but when it comes to these nuanced issues like politics and dealing with other people and talent, I think that he's made numerous unforced missteps. The first one was obviously with the talent Scarlett Johansson, making a huge public lawsuit against Disney over the Black Widow treatment. This is something that I don't think would have happened if Bob Iger was running the company. But since Bob Chapek took over, and he's not used to handling these situations, we have this big embarrassing debacle unfolding for Disney. And now they're in another one. They've wrapped themselves in the political controversy. The whole controversy that Disney's wrapped in is centered around this bill. The Florida bill prohibits classroom instruction on gender identity and sexual orientation for school children through grade three and limits it for older students to materials that are quote age appropriate. Now, whether or not you agree personally with this bill or are against it, I think is beside the point. The question is whether or not Disney, as a corporation, should be publicly fighting these type of battles. I don't see what the strategy is here from Disney. I don't see how this benefits shareholders in the long run. In fact, this could have potential for very severe backlash. Some Republican lawmakers in Florida are threatening to end special tax districts that has allowed the company to effectively govern the land on which Disney sits. So Disney's getting special treatment from the government. 
where they're treated differently than every other company and they have special benefits. And now lawmakers are asking the question, why are we giving Disney special benefits when they're going into politics and publicly fighting against us? Every couple of years, the Mickey Mouse copyright goes up to be renewed and Disney has to get approval to renew it. That's reliant on politicians and members of Congress. And the drama on this continues. Politicians are campaigning for re-election on promises to stand up against Disney. Fans and park workers have protested outside the company's headquarters earlier this month, and others have used social media to call for boycotts against Disney's parks and its flagship streaming service, Disney+. Plus. This political backlash of Disney is two months running now, and it seems to be getting more severe. Here's one of the clips of Ron DeSantis talking about Disney's stance on the issue. You know, we signed the, the parents' rights in education bill. It's interesting when, like, a Disney-owned ABC would put that out on tweet. They'd say, Governor DeSantis signs bill to prohibit uh, instruction in sexual identity and gender identity in some grades. Some grades. Why would they say some grades instead of K through three? It's just amazing if you're trying to inform the root. So you saw a lot of this. But then for Disney to come out and put a statement and say that the bill should have never passed and that they are going to actively work to repeal it, I think one was fundamentally dishonest. But two, I think that crossed the line. This state is governed by the interests of the people of the state of Florida. It is not based on the demands of California corporate executives. They do not run this state. They do not control this state. No matter which way you stand on this issue, it doesn't look good for Disney. As Disney enters into the second month of fallout from handling of the Florida bill, now politicians and fans, more than employees, who are using the company as a punching bag, underscoring how perilous it can be for a family-oriented entertainment company to take a stand on sensitive social issues. This is the problem I see in what Disney's doing. Why is an entertainment company getting so heavily involved in political nuanced issues? And I think the more that Disney pushes on these issues, the more pushback they're going to get. Disney has wielded an enormous amount of power in the state and has basically been untouchable, but now they are in the weakest position politically in more than 50 years. DeSante says that Disney has held so much sway they were able to sustain a lot of special treatment over the years. And if that stops now, which it should, that'll be a good thing for Florida. So Disney has been enjoying a lot of different special benefits in Florida from the government by being friendly with them. And now that they're lashing out against them and going into politics, they're starting to see these things be highlighted. Disney saves tens of millions of dollars a year by avoiding paying certain county and state taxes and fees by having the Reedy Creek District, a special district carved out for them that makes it so that they can avoid taxes, they can do their own building codes and environmental rules, they don't really have to follow the rest of what Florida's doing. If they remove the Reedy Creek District, that makes it a lot more cumbersome for Disney to operate. And then of course, Disney's being highlighted as a company that's hypocritical because they're going into these nuanced debates and politics in the US while making large investments in China where human right violations are abundant. So many people ask me what my thoughts are on this type of news as a Disney shareholder. I own a sizable amount of Disney stock and I continue to own this company because I think it's one of the greatest entertainment companies in the world. And when I look at news like this, I wish Disney would be less involved in it. I don't think this serves the shareholder. I don't think it serves Disney as a company and their long-term goal and objective. I don't think it serves them as an entertainment company. Politics is a dirty game. And whenever you get involved in it, you're going to get muddy like everyone else. I think this is damaging the reputation of Disney, and I think it's damaging the business's long-term prospects. And I view this as the second unforced error from Bob Chapek since becoming CEO. The first one was being sued by Scarlett Johansson. So I get that he's learning the new CEO role, and he does have some positive characteristics. I think the parks will perform well. They seem to be packed right now. I think that Disney Plus is going to continue to grow. So operationally, I think the company's doing really well. But when it comes to these other things, these other nuanced issues, like treating talent well, navigating the world of politics, I think that Bob Chapek apparently has a lot to figure out. Now, the next piece of news I think is positive news for everyone that's not detached from reality. For a while, we were going into lunacy. We were going into a territory where nothing made sense. We had a Jack Dorsey tweet, NFT, which is essentially a screenshot of a tweet that sold for $2.9 million. That's real money. 
$2.9 million. This wasn't fake money. This wasn't monopoly money. This was 2.9 million real dollars. Now the tweet is coming closer to its real value, to its fair value of $0. So let's go ahead and see how all of this unfolded. Mr. Astavi, the buyer of this tweet originally, and the person that seems to be very detached from reality, said, quote, this is not just a tweet. I think years later, people realized the true value of this tweet, like the Mona Lisa painting. He just compared a screenshot NFT of Jack Dorsey's tweet to possibly the most famous and valuable painting in the world, the Mona Lisa. He's comparing those two things together, and he's doing that with a straight face. And if you think that comparison's a little bit detached from reality, take a look at what he expected it to sell for. He was expecting this NFT to sell for at least $50 million. $50 million. Now, the highest bid was a little bit shy of $50 million. It was $13,940. In my opinion, that's around $13,940 too much, but I think it's getting closer, a lot closer to its fair value. Mr. Stavi says he's now rethinking the sale altogether. I think that's good. I think that he has more than one thing to rethink. The low bids come as the NFT market has slowed in recent months. Global monthly sales of NFTs totaled almost 5 billion last August, according to CryptoSlam, a site that aggregates NFT data. In March, the sales were down 2.4 billion. So the NFT market as a whole, month over month, is slowing down like crazy. And I think over the coming months, we're going to see a lot more headlines just like this one. Now, lastly, we have news that another one of my companies, another large holding, is starting to be unionized. We have Apple workers at New York's Grand Central Store take steps to unionize. They say organizers who have dubbed themselves Fruit Stand Workers United... I may be critical of the union effort here, but I do appreciate the good naming here. Fruit Stand Workers United is a pretty awesome name. They are in the process of collecting signatures from workers, according to FSWU's website. Employees are seeking representation by Workers United, an affiliate of the Service Employees International Union, which has overseen the successful union efforts at some Starbucks stores in the US. So the same exact group, Workers United, that is being successful in unionizing a bunch of Starbucks stores has now moved on to bigger targets. They're going for Apple. Now you might be asking, what are these employees wanting that Apple currently isn't providing them? Well, the FSWU explains what they're demanding. They're demanding higher wages, greater bargaining power with Apple over benefits, workplace safety, and other employment matters. That's pretty vague terms, not really pointing out anything that Apple's actually doing wrong or being uncompetitive with. They're just saying they want everything. Better workplace safety, employment matters, higher wages, bargaining power, benefits, so on and so forth. They say the group pointed to how Apple, the most valuable company in the world, has seen its fortunes grow while, quote, its retail workers live precariously. So this is the root of the problem here. The big argument for Apple retail employees to unionize is Apple has a lot of money. That's really what this comes down to. Because if you look at Apple as a corporation and how they treat their retail employees, Apple is one of the best retail employer in the industry. An Apple spokesperson said the company offers, quote, very strong compensation and benefits for full-time and part-time employees. Apple pays its retail workers a starting wage of $20 per hour and provides benefits such as parental leave and stock grants. And just recently, in fact, earlier this year, Apple doubled their sick days and boosted other benefits for retail workers. Now, I think it will be interesting to see how Apple responds to this amidst the ongoing unionization effort across the U.S. We have, of course, Amazon being unionized. We have Starbucks being unionized. We have Google Fiber contractors trying to support a union effort as well. So this is happening with every major company. And we're going to see how different companies respond to this. I think that some companies have a lot more tools to deal with this than others. I think that Apple is actually in an advantageous position. They already give such competitive pay and such good benefits that I think they're in a much better position to deal with unions than other companies. So just like in the case of Amazon or Starbucks, I don't see the case of unionization for Apple as being something that really changes the outcome of the company. I think that the long-term success of Apple is not going to be determined by a union.
So as of right now, I don't plan on selling or changing anything with my Apple shares as I think unionization will have an immaterial effect on the company. Overall, I'm still bullish on every single company in my portfolio. And even though the market's really difficult right now and really discouraging, I plan on continuing to stick to my plan of buying incrementally, reinvesting dividends, and buying the companies that are in the most severe dip. So if you want to see how this turns out over the long term, you can subscribe to the channel and follow along for free. But that's all for this episode. I'll see you in the next one.